Well, good morning, church family. Hi. Just in case you don't know me as you come in this morning, as you're coming in to get seated, um, my name is Shelby Yerrick. I am the music director here at RLC, and I am so glad that you have joined us here in person this morning, and hi to our friends online. Hi to my husband, Taylor, and Levi, who are home on the sick couch this morning. Um, I am so glad that each of you has joined us today, though. Let's see. If you are here for the first time, please fill out the form that you got in your brochure on the way in, and you can put that in the offering tubes or bring it out to the welcome desk just to the left in the foyer. And if anybody has a prayer request, you'll see a little part in the back of your brochure that says prayer request, and you can fill in that and, again, put it in the offering tubes or put it um, at the welcome desk out in the foyer. We would love to pray for you. Now let's take a quick look at what's happening at church this week. First of all, happy Palm Sunday. (laughs) In terms of Jesus' life, this was the Sunday that Jesus arrived in Jerusalem riding on a donkey while people laid their robes down and waved palm branches. Days later, these same people would be calling for his execution. That being said, in one week, it is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. For those of you who are new here, as a church, we work on a special presentation for Resurrection Sunday. And so, for Res Kids parents, if your child is signed up to participate in our Resurrection Sunday special, your mandatory practices are tomorrow, Monday at 6 p.m., and this Saturday at 8.30 a.m. And if you have questions, you can see Ms. Kelly Reese. And for Quest, um, Quest is asking if you could come around 9 or 9.15 for when they begin to start at 9.30. And for everybody else, our Resurrection Sunday service is next Sunday at 10 a.m. It's one service. It will be live streamed, and please invite your family and friends to come and join us. On Wednesday, our Life Care Midweek service has started, and it started two weeks ago. Yeah, I gotta love it. Let's go ahead and watch a quick video right now on Life Care Groups. Good morning, church family. This is Dennis Sandberg. I'm here to encourage you about our upcoming Life Care services. Uh, Members and guests are welcome to attend each meeting, each Wednesday, uh, whether in person or in Zoom. If the, if the weather's inclement and you want to uh, do by Zoom, that would be fine. As I was looking and thinking about the ministry of life care, I was looking at the ministry of Jesus here on earth. And I see him teaching and preaching to various places, like he was preaching to the multitudes. And there was times that he was, he was alone with his father and then there was other times that he, he preached and was, a, was with his 12 disciples. The meetings with those disciples is similar to life care. In Psalms 133.1, in the easy-to-read version, it says, Oh, how wonderful, how pleasing it is when God's people all come together as one. It's called life care, but we really could call it a life care and share. It's important to share with others and give testimony to God's goodness in our lives. It's important to build each other up through encouragement and with prayer. I hope you all are waiting and expecting a great service from God today and hear from God through our pastor. God speaks a specific word that each of us need each and every time. Life care is a wonderful opportunity to share those God-inspired revelations that you receive each and every Sunday. Life care is a terrific way to gain insight and allowing you to share God's word that spoke to you personally. You may also be able to gain more knowledge to a point in the service you didn't quite understand. Others will help you to understand. We invite you to come to the life care to learn from each other, build up our strength in God's word, and improve any weaknesses that you might have. There has not been a life care service that I personally have not been to where I haven't been encouraged by God's word and what it spoke to me. If you haven't given it a try a while, I really encourage you to do so. You will be blessed. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Dennis. All right, so also happening on Wednesdays, we have a half hour of power, um, Wednesday mornings from 9 to 9.30 here at church. You can stay up to date with our RLC worship playlist and stay connected. Now, Pastor Jeremy did talk a little bit about this, but the heart behind this is that you would have another opportunity to engage with the music that we're playing here um, and that we're worshiping with here outside of every, every Sunday um, so that you can already be familiar with it and you can enter in to praise and worship um, even faster because you're already familiar with those songs. So um, there is information on how to connect with that on the little table tents in the cafe. You just scan, you open your your picture, your camera on your phone and you scan it you, and a little box will come up and you click on it and it'll take you right to our um, YouTube playlist. Um, and if you're not following us on social media, it would be great if you did. We're doing a lot for Easter. Um, we had very interesting conversation about black jelly beans. And those of you who like black licorice, I now know who you are. It is not me. My dad loves black licorice, though. Um, so if you want to take a, a look in, at our social medias, you can find us on X, um, Instagram, Facebook, and you can find us on the church app, and you will find all of our announcements there. Your giving can be done by mail. The giving tubes right out by the exits and on the church website or through the church app via push pay. So let's talk about tithes and offerings this morning. I would like to start right off with a scripture. Scripture says in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. Whatever I invest into will be multiplied back to me because of my faith in God's goodness. You know, I have been challenged by the Lord lately to increase my generosity. It makes me very uncomfortable. There was one occasion that just happened recently. I was hoping to sell a slightly expensive piece of equipment. I went through all of the trouble to box this thing up. I, sell, I sold it online and, you know, got the shipping label and all that. And I brought it to the post office and put it in the box. And then the Holy Spirit nudged me that I was supposed to give it to her and not sell it to her. I didn't want to at first and I didn't want to for several days. Um, but I knew that like this verse says, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And so sowing generosity um, produces a harvest of generosity. So whatever we sow to, including the tithe to the local church, will be returned to us. Let's give ourselves a blank check today on giving to God. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful to come together to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. We thank you that wherever two or more are gathered, that your word says that you are amongst us, God. And we thank you that as we commit our tithes and offerings to you as an act of worship, God, that you would be glorified, that you would cause our tithes and offerings to be multiplied, to do the good things that you have set apart for them to do. God, we ask you that um, to just be with us this morning. We thank you for changed hearts and changed minds and hearts that are open and willing to receive from you this morning, God. Um, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, church family, stand with me this morning as we worship our risen King.
walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now Thank you Lord This is our God, this is who he is He loves us this is our God, this is what He does He saves us He bore the cross, beat the grave Let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, King Jesus Oh, let's shout to the King of kings and the Lord of lords Hallelujah Remember that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never once did he fail and he never This is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody, nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. For the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Not because he needed it. He knew we needed it. And he wanted to give us a way back to him. And he's done that. And now the one who came as the sacrificial lamb, who died on the cross to pay the price for our sin, who went into hell and death and the grave and was raised leading captivity captive, is now seated at the right hand of our heavenly Father, and you know what he's doing? He's praying for you. If anybody's prayers get answers, his do. And he's praying prayers because he loves you, because he has a great plan for you that is beyond anything you can imagine or dream, but he's not saying, okay, here, do it. He's saying, 
Let's do it. Because he's with you every step of the way, in every blessing, and in every battle. He is so good, isn't he? Let's give him a shout. Of Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. Thank you. Aren't you grateful for the praise and worship team? Well, we're going to dismiss any of the children that are in here from uh, six weeks to sixth grade. They're going to head over to the Rainforest Wing. And anybody from seventh grade to twelfth, they're going to head over to the Quest Wing. If you're still left here, th then take a moment and greet some of the people around you, and you can be seated. You know, I just sense that there's a great building in the body of Christ, this expectation to be able to celebrate this Resurrection Sunday that's coming to celebrate the victory that Jesus won and he has given to his body to go forth and show forth his victory, his love, his kingdom, and the life abundant that he has available to everyone. Um, you know, we, we tend at times to just go through things and, and not recognize everything there. You know, nobody ever has the full picture except for God. And that's part of the reason why we need each other. We need different perspectives and input and understanding. But uh, one of the things that we've done here, we're trying to do is, is make you aware that you're not just coming in to this place and this is all there is because when you walk through the foyer and you see the flags and you read the plaques underneath it, you see the countries that you are invested in through your prayer, through your finances, you are making an investment in the kingdom of God going forth in all these different places. And sometimes it's easy to walk through and, and not even notice. I asked somebody what they thought of the flags one day and they said, what flags? <laughs> honest, honest. And, and it's sometimes I walk through and I don't notice them and I'm making a point every time I walk through there to pray and say, God, thank you. Thank you for the people that are giving their lives and doing your work and reaching these people for your kingdom. Father, bless them, be with them, empower them, impart to them. And today uh, we're going to have a video from one of the missionaries that we support. It's new missions in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. But this is Tim DeTillis, who is the president of new missions, and uh, he wanted to share a message with you. So if we could s watch. Greetings from New Missions, I'm Tim DeTellis. And today I want to share with you a special update regarding the situation happening in Haiti. And I'm thankful today that we're going to be greeted by Pastor Yagil at New Missions in Nepali. Let's listen to this message from Pastor Yagil. Greetings from Haiti. I'm Pastor Yagil at New Missions Church in Nepali, Bodmer. Thank you so much for praying for Haiti. Our churches are praying together. We are preaching God's words. Our school are serving children. We love you. Today I want to thank you. As we hear from Haiti, as we pray for Haiti, we know that God is still at work through our churches and our schools because of your faithful support and prayers. So thank you for standing firm with us. We are not giving up, we are trusting the Lord, and we are going to continue to preach the gospel and make disciples through our churches and schools in Haiti. So I thank God for you, and I'm thankful for our mission 
that is rooted in scripture and believes that the local church is the greatest force for good. But today we do remember to pray for Haiti, pray for our leadership there on the ground, and pray for the children and families that we serve. May their faith stay strong, and may they know that there is hope in God. What you don't realize is that New Missions ministers to hundreds of children and families in one of the poorest nations in our hemisphere. And they're doing a great job, but they aren't the only ones in Haiti. There are a, a number of missionaries in Haiti doing what they're doing, and it's easy for us to look at something like that and say, oh yeah, I'll pray sometime. But they're going through things that we aren't in a way that we can't even, even imagine or relate to. And so I just want to take a moment and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for new missions and all the missionaries that you have sent into that country to show forth your love, to build your kingdom, and to build the church. Lord, we thank you for providing for all their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We thank you also for strategic wisdom and understanding that would enable them to be very, very productive in what you're doing. Father, we thank you for all the children uh, and all the families that are being ministered to through New Missions. We thank you for Brother Tim and his team that are overseeing these things. And Father, we thank you that even in the times that we're in, where things at times seem unstable and without security. We thank you that you surround them with your protection. You abundantly supply their provision as they distribute to all these people in need. And that, Father, they would continue to make inroads into the kingdom of darkness and bring people into the kingdom of life and light. Father, thank you for allowing us the privilege and the honor to partner with them. And Lord, we just thank you for continuing to build your church and your kingdom in Haiti that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. And everyone shouted, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, it's a good thing to know that, that you're having an impact because we've been told we're supposed to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And we can't get everywhere all the time, but we can support people wherever they are. And that's what we always try and do. And everybody that you see represented in the flags out there is, is an organization or a person that we have personal relationship with. It's not something that we just send money off to and, and pray for. We know them and they know us. Uh, we're going to be having some people come in uh, that are missionaries, uh, Rabbi Stewart's going to be in this year. Amen. We're going to see, we're seeing about some others, but just know that these people truly, truly appreciate you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Palm Sunday. Right? You can, you can have Palm Sunday any day. You can raise the palm branches to God every day. These are not real. We looked into getting some real ones. But, you know, when we think about Palm Sunday, we know that it's called the triumphant entry of Jesus. Is that right? And that's what it's labeled in the Bible. And it was, but it's not everything it seems. And so today we're going to look at this. We're going to investigate it from one of the Gospels. This, is, this account is in all four Gospels. It's in... Luke chapter 19, Mark chapter 11, John chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, but before we do, we're going to pray. So if you bow your heads and just prepare your hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you. <laughs> it is at times absolutely overwhelming that you, the creator of the universe, desires intimacy and fellowship and relationship with us. 
You who are perfect and almighty and all-knowing, love us unconditionally and desire to reveal yourself to us, to impart and impact our lives, that we would have an influence on the people that don't know who you are yet or don't know who you really are. And help them come to that place of loving you, doing life with you, trusting you, and serving you. Father, today, help us to see your word in the light of truth. Help us to understand and help us to realize how it applies to us, especially in the times we're living in. Father, we thank you for Holy Spirit giving us revelation so that we can apply your truth to our life and experience transformation going from glory to glory. And Father, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to speak your word, to be a servant of yours. I thank you, Father, for doing what only you can do. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, okay, so Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 1, I want you to know that this was the time where they were going to celebrate one of the feasts. Now, there were certain feasts that God had told Israel, you need to celebrate these every year. And some of these, God said, you need to come back to Jerusalem, and this was one of them, the Feast of Passover. Now, Passover was a remembrance of what? Anybody know? The exodus from Egypt, right? What happened was God planned to re release Israel from Egypt. They were held in bondage. They were, they were being worked mercilessly and beaten. Things were bad. And yet God had a plan. And he was delivering them, bringing them out of this place of torment and torture and difficulties and bring them into the promised land. And so he gave them instruction that you need to do certain things. One of them was you need to slay a lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the posts and the, the lentil of the door because there was a death that was going to come through Egypt and when death came through and saw the blood, it would pass over that house. But if there was no blood, death would visit the youngest male in that household. And God did deliver Israel. And so they, they always celebrate this. And at this moment, there were thousands of people coming to Jerusalem. You know, sometimes we read things and we read it in a sterile mindset that this was the only thing going on, but it wasn't. It was a big thing. It was bigger than anybody knew or anybody really took notice of, but there were so many people everywhere that this was just one of among a number of things that were going on. So... We'll start reading in verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loosen them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now, when you look at this, we need to look at this in light of what would happen today. What would this be like today? Exactly. That's exactly right. But we have this big crowd everywhere, and Jesus is telling his disciples. Now, who were the disciples? Which ones? No, it says two. Which were the two he chose? We don't know. We don't know. Well, why don't we know? You know, inquiring minds want to know. Because it doesn't matter. 
Because these two that were chosen were servants. We've been learning about servants and how if they're going to be available and obedient, willing and obedient, the scripture says they'll eat the best of the land. We'll experience things that nobody else will if we'll put ourselves in the place of being available to God. Because God's not impressed by our abilities. None of our abilities is God impressed by. And the reason why is he gave them to us. And he can give us whatever he wants to give us. But what he is impressed by is our availability. How available are we to God? Is God able to interrupt our schedule, our plans, our, our preparations? If, if he were to say something to us that was out of the norm, would, be we, would we be willing to adjust to him or would we say to him, hey, wait, I've got some things planned. I'll get to it eventually. I know we all want to say, no, I'd be available to God. But how often are we really open to God telling us what he wants us to do because that's really what we're here for. We're here to do his will. And so he tells these two disciples, here's what you're going to do. In this mass of humanity, you're going to go into Jerusalem. This is where you're going. This is what you're going to find. And if there's any problem, this is what you're going to say. It would be like going into Rome or Utica or someplace else going into the driveway of somebody's house, finding a car with the keys in it, opening up the door and hopping in and starting to back out because donkeys were a mode of transportation. This would be like Grand Theft Auto. It, it would be. People get killed for stealing like this. And so this is what he says. And you notice the disciples don't say, why? Why do you want me to do this? See, if we're going to be those servants that hear from the master, well done, good and faithful servant, we got to drop the why. We've got to drop the why. The Bible says in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with what? And lean not to your own understanding. And in all ways, he'll direct your steps. And we've got to get to that place. Do we trust him? And I want to say yes, but I've seen in my life areas where I'll question before I'll obey. And that questioning is a delayed response to God because I don't trust him. Because I think I need to put the okay stamp on his plan. I know none of you do that, but it's something that I've become very aware of in my life. And, and so he sends them and tells them, now look, if you run into any trouble, just tell them. The Lord has need of this. We find out in two of the other Gospels that when they did this, the owners came out and said, what are you doing? And you know what they did? They didn't do what I would have done. I would have run. But they stood there and they said, the Lord has need of this, and it was released to them. This is a miracle. If somebody came to your house and you happened to have left the keys in your car and they, you saw them opening the door and getting in, unless your car is a complete pile of junk and you just want it out of the driveway, you'd go out there and you'd say, what are you doing? And if they said to you, the Lord has need of your car, would you be like, okay, I understand completely. Miracle upon miracle upon miracle. They go where he, he told them to go and finds what he told them they'd find and then says what he told them to say. And it worked. It's amazing what God tells us works. 
some of us ought to try it. But they, they, they are in this environment that is so electrified by all the people and all the movement and all these things. And this is, this is a, an insight into an area of what God's doing in the midst of what everybody else is doing. How many of you know that God isn't doing everything everybody's doing? Even if they say it's God. We, we at times don't see God because we're so looking at everything else that's going on around us. And if we don't see God, we can't possibly follow God. And when I say see God, become aware of what God's doing. You know, many times we want to pray and say, God, bless what I'm doing and that's questionable because God may not be able to bless what you're doing because it may not be what he has for you to do. But you can always be assured that God will bless what he wants you to do. And so there was this blessing and this miracle that occurred. And it was hard to believe when these guys took off this was going to happen. But, you know, that's what faith is. Faith is believing before you see it. And the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible. This is the Bible saying this, so it's true. It's impossible to please God. So God wants us to walk in faith. And faith is usually very uncomfortable for us because we want to see it before we believe it. And God says, if you know me and I've said it, you need to believe it before you see it. And enter into what the Bible tells us is a rest of faith. Faith is a rest. And the reason why it's a rest is because there's a confidence. A confidence that settles us down that we're not just doing something that we thought was good or they thought was good or somebody said was good. This is what God has said and what God says is always the best. We settle into, you know what, if he said it, he'll do it. We've got to get to that place, church. It's not an easy place to get to, but it's the best place to be. And living in that place of, of absolutely believing God for what he has said and what he will do because he's not a man that he would lie. We see these, these two disciples that were servants, but we're also seeing the greatest servant of all, Jesus. This is about Jesus as the greatest servant of all, serving his Father's will and laying down his life for every human being. The Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, than he would lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. So the question is today, we're approaching Resurrection Sunday. We're gonna celebrate the victory but the question is today, whose will are you doing? Who are we serving? Because Jesus said, I'm not serving myself. I'm serving the one who sent me. As a servant, that's a good and faithful one who's doing well. He's serving the purpose of, of his heavenly father. Then in verse 4 through 6, it says this. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as he commanded. So why did Jesus send the disciples out to get this donkey in its fold? He needed it, but why did he need it? He could have walked in on his own, couldn't he? Because of the prophecy. You see, again, Jesus has this reference point. He knows what the prophets have said. And he's not just going to do what's easy. It would have been easier for him to just walk in instead of sending the disciples through all this rigmarole possibly getting jacked up because they're taking this guy's donkey and colt. 
And he's down two disciples because they're in prison or they're dead. But he's doing it because he's doing what his father had proclaimed would happen. One of the messianic prophecies. You know, in the Old Testament, there are more than 300 messianic prophecies. There was a mathematician that did a, a study on the probability of Jesus fulfilling the messianic prophecies. And he determined the probability if one person fulfilled only 48, all right? The probability of one person fulfilling only 48 of the over 300 messianic prophecies, the probability was one over 10. And I can't tell you what the number is, but it had 157 zeros behind it. That's indicating it's almost impossible. 48. Jesus fulfilled over 300 of the Messianic prophecies and will, before he comes back, fulfill all of them. And so he was doing this not because of anything other than he was submitting himself to his father's will, doing exactly what his father said, because he knew if he would be obedient to his father, his father would take care of him. The same way with you and me. If we are servants of the Most High God and we're, we're willing and we're obedient, our Heavenly Father will support and sustain us through everything. Wherever God guides, he will provide. And we can be assured of that. We can be absolutely assured of that. So the disciples went and did as they were commanded. Again, no, no discourse, no discussion, no questions, no nothing back and forth. Just do it. And you thought Nike made up that slogan. This is an amazing thing because this is going on. And, and, and who, Jesus is the son of God, but when he began his ministry, do you remember where, where he went? He went out to John the Baptist. And again, he was going out to John the Baptist to be obedient to what should happen. And John was gonna, his cousin John was gonna baptize him in the Jordan River. And John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He could have said, hey, cuz. People knew him as somebody's son, somebody's neighbor. But John had a revelation, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We need to see God for who he is, not who we make him out to be, not how we've related to him, because God is God and there's no one like him. There's no one better, there's no one smarter, there's no one more powerful, and he loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He loves us before we ever loved him. And there's nothing that will change his love for you and his plan for you. You know what it is in Jeremiah 29, 11, a plan for good and not for evil with a future and a hope. But it says, I have not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared. I mean, they are just awesome for those who love him. It should put a security in our hearts that no matter what we encounter, we know God knew what was ahead. We also know God is a God that will empower and impart to us what we need to be overwhelmingly more than conquerors. As Jesus faced the cross, he struggled just like we struggle. This doesn't look good. If this can pass away, let it pass away. 
But, but, you know, we all struggle. But we always need to let one win. I remember when my brother was little, I would just not beat up on him physically all the time. But we would play games and I would always win. And he'd go crying to mom and dad and say, I, I don't ever win. And dad would come to me. And my dad was 6'4". And he would say, let your brother win. Okay, dad. And, and occasionally I would let him win. And it just was awful to let him win because I wanted to win. I deserve to win. I'm the older brother. I always win. <laughs> Until my little brother grew beyond my size, grew beyond my dad's size. He's six, six. That was the time when great wisdom came to my heart. No longer is there competition between the Heck brothers. We'll talk this out. We'll share. We'll be kind to one another. But my brother never forgot. I was praying for amnesia for him. But we want to win all the time. But you know what? When we win, we lose. Because the only time we can be guaranteed of a win is if we let God win. Let him win. And it's an amazing thing because, you know, there were people in the Bible that wrestled with God. And they didn't win. And we wrestle with God and we don't win. But we're wrestling against the very win we need. It's time to give in, not to look to win. Give in to God, just like Jesus did. He let God the Father have his way. So this is going on. The disciples did what they were commanded. Then in verse 7, it says this. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before him and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, in reading this, I, I, I have a question for you. Does do you know why they put their clothes on the road and did all that kind of stuff? You know, we just kind of, we just kind of accept it. You know, this is the triumphal entry of Jesus. And this is what they did. And, and, you know, they just got excited. But there's reason behind this. They're crying out Hosanna, and the word Hosanna means, oh, save or save us. It's not the Messiah. They're looking to be saved. And why they put their coats on the road was because over 200 years before, Jerusalem was occupied by a Syrian king and his army, and he was brutal. He was beating the Jews mercilessly. And there was a guy, Judas Maccabee, that had had enough. And he gathered his brothers and whoever else would join his little army. And they went to stand up to this king, the Syrian king and his massive army. And God gave them the victory. And he drove out the army and he drove out the king. And spontaneously, people began to wave palm branches because they were celebrating their liberator and the victory. And so they were, they were there with the branches. They were putting them on the, the road. They were waving them, but they put their clothes on the road for Jesus to be able to ride over when he rode on this colt 
And this is a donkey that is less than one year old. How do you think Jesus fit on this little donkey? Was, was it really awesome and something that they were just in awe of? No, it says that he came lowly riding on a donkey. But they put their coats down because that was an indication that they were, they were going to submit to his authority. That they were going to come under his authority. And so they're looking at Jesus. They're yelling, oh, save us. They're waving these branches and putting branches on the ground as signifying it was a national symbol for acknowledging a liberator, one who would free them. And, and many times we think this was all them seeing him as the Messiah coming. And as Shelby said, the same people that were yelling and screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, going before him and following him, were the same people that later on were part of the crowd that yelled, crucify him. How quickly they change. How fickle. But we, we don't need to be taught that. We know that. We've been that at times. We say we trust God, and then we go and do what we can do to see if we can fix it before he gets a hold of it. Oh, maybe not you. I do that. I'm trying to do it less. But this massive crowd is going down what's called the Palm Sunday Road. I've been there. Debbie and I have been there. And it's amazing because Jesus is going into Jerusalem and he's going down the Palm Sunday Road, and this whole thing is going on. But one of the things we don't know and we don't realize, but history tells us that that road and all the roads leading into Jerusalem were lined with a greater number of Roman soldiers than had previously been there. Because with the influx of the hundreds, if not thousands of people that were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, they wanted to show the people coming in, we're here. And you just can't do what you want. We are a presence, and you better behave. But in the midst of that, when we see this situation going on, here's Jesus. He's sitting on a donkey. He's got his disciples near him. He's got this crowd shouting Hosanna as liberators. That piqued the Romans' attention because they didn't want an overthrow. And so they were on alert because when the Romans had a triumphal entry, it wasn't exactly the same. When they had a triumphal, triumphal entry, when a general had conquered another king or a kingdom, he would come in one of two ways. He would either come in in a golden chariot pulled by white horses, not quite a donkey, or he would come in on a white stallion with his lower ranking officers right behind him, and then behind them would come the conquered king. And behind that would be all the military that had been involved in that battle. And they're standing on the sides and they're watching this happen. And they're hearing the people yell, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Save us. Oh, save us. And this is supposed to be like a triumphal entry, but I'm sure they're all laughing at the ridiculousness of what this looks like versus what they have. And yet the victory that Jesus was coming in to bring was the greatest victory ever won. He was going to lay down his life to give life to every human being if they chose. And so they're yelling and screaming this and they're, they're celebrating. And yet Jesus knew. Well, how did he know? Jesus knew. 
that what they were yelling, oh, save us, deliver us, you're our liberator, it wasn't what he was coming to do. You know, sometimes we look at God and, and we have a perspective of what we think God ought to be doing and when he ought to do it and how he ought to do it. Can anybody here relate? And yet we're missing it by miles. Because what we believe is best is not nearly as good as what God wants to do. What God wants to do in our lives and through our lives is beyond our ability to fully comprehend. And that's why what he does is he gives us in part. He'll give us enough to be obedient. Even the little bit that he gives us sometimes causes us to question, God, can I do this? And the reason why that is is because of who we're looking at. Our first look most times when we're becoming aware of something God may want us to do, our first look is at us. I can't tell you how many people, when we've gone to them and said, hey, you know, we were, we were praying, wanted to ask you, would you be involved in the children's ministry? I can't do that. Okay. So... Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me except for the children's ministry. We can do whatever God asks us to do, but it's going to be always beyond us. Anytime God invites you to walk in his will, it's always going to be beyond your abilities because God never intended you to do it alone. God has always made himself available, not only with a plan, but with his plan. That he's going to be there every step of the way. He'll give you the grace. He'll give you the wisdom. He'll give you the understanding, the insight. He'll give you the gifts that you need. He'll give you team that you need. Everything you need. The Apostle Paul said, my God will supply what? All your needs. So when God starts to tug on your heart, he starts to make something known in our lives, our first sense is, oh, I can't do that. But don't look at you. Because your track record, we all have them. But what we've done and what we've been is not what God has for us to be and what God has for us to do. There's a new and living way God has for you to walk in. And it's a life that is lived with God and for God. Because we can't live for God if we're not living with God. The grace we were saved by is the same grace we need every day to live life with God. The same grace we need that we were saved by is the same grace we need to be able to serve God, to be what he's called us to be and do what he's called us to do. And that's why we can't, we can't afford, we can't fall into the trap the enemy sets where we look at us and we judge us because we don't know us. God does. He created us. And he knows the gifts that are in you that you don't even know. God knows your potential. And we always either come out too high or too low thinking too little of ourselves or too much of ourselves when we come to understand that the only thing we can do that's good is going to be by his grace and for his glory and it's going to be in his love. And these people are looking at Jesus and they're seeing him as a natural liberator. What they wanted more than anything else at that moment, they were done. They were overdone 
with the Roman occupation, with the Roman oppression. And this time was a time where Israelites, Jews were coming in from all over. And it would be a prime time to try and overthrow the Roman government. Yet Jesus wasn't coming to overthrow the Roman government, but the people wanted that. That's what they were looking at him for. Oh, save us. Oh, save us. But the salvation, the liberation, the freedom that they were looking for was temporary. And what Jesus was coming to do, we know, was more than that. It was eternal freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from fear. Freedom from lack. That God would be there and provide everything. Let's go on to 10. It goes on to say, and when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? In the Gospel of John, it says, as he approached Jerusalem, he began to weep as he saw Jerusalem. He wept because he said, you don't know who it is that is coming to you. These people that are celebrating their inner frenzy, they're expecting this great, great overthrow of Rome. That was so low compared to what God was going to do. And they were missing what God had planned and expected and was powerful enough to do. In Luke chapter 19, and this isn't going to be up there, Jesus knew their cries were a misunderstanding of what their expectation was. It says, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. If you had known the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And that word peace is a word we've talked about before. It's the word irene. It means to set it one again. It wasn't peace as tranquility. Everybody is playing nice with everybody else because that can change at any time by anybody's choice. Is that right? Yes? We know that. We, we, we have family celebrations, all of us, and everybody's doing nice, and then all of a sudden something happens. You didn't do it, but now you're in the midst of it. And we want this external peace that God never promised you'd have this external peace. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world does. And the world's peace is, okay, we're shutting everybody down. Go to your own corners, be nice. And it hasn't worked yet. Because God has for us to have a peace where when things start to happen and they're difficult, they're stressful, it kind of churns things up inside, doesn't it? You guys are tough this morning. Yeah, we, we, are, we get in knots, we get overwhelmed, we get undone. You can wor- use whatever words you want. But it's because we get our focus off God. The one thing Jesus never did was lost sight of his Father and his will. Remember when Peter asked Jesus to ask him to come out of the boat and he started to walk on the water? What caused him to sink? That's right, he got his eyes off Jesus. He started to see the circumstances around him. He looked at the waves and the wind and he began to sink. Same thing happens with us. When we get our eyes off God, the things that are surrounding us begin to swallow us up. And Jesus would not move his focus from his Father. Always kept his eyes on his Father, knowing that no matter what, if the people don't understand, I'm still going to do my Father's will.
So they ask, who is this? Not even knowing. And here's how the multitudes responded. This is Jesus. Were they right? Yeah, that's his name. The prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. The Bible says if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. Now, to break that down into everyday language, if you receive a plumber as a plumber, you get the plumber's reward. He can do some good for you, but if you don't see he's a plumber, you'll never get the benefit. And he was just a prophet to them. So there was a level that they would receive on, but there was a greater level that they were missing from receiving from God. And it's the same thing with us. How we view God, what is he? He's a ticket to heaven. Well, then you're going to miss all the heaven that he wants to bring to you and through you here in the earth. Who is he to you? Jesus asked that question to his disciples at one point. Who do they say I am? And they were able to tell. And then he said, who do you say I am? Because that's really the bottom line. Who do you say God is? Who is Jesus to you? Is he just the guy that gets you to heaven? Or is he the one that walks with you every day? He's not just your savior, he's your Lord too. He's the one that you rely on. You release to everything. You relate to in everything. Because if we'll do that, man, we're going to have all of God and all of heaven's resources available to us at every step. And do you think there's anything that heaven lacks that you would ever need here? No, never. Never, never, never. So he was the prophet, and they missed the point. They missed the bigger point. Then in verse 12 and 13, it says this. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. That kind of blows the, the perspective that Jesus was just, just this mic, uh, meek and mild guy. He goes in to the temple and he turns over the money changers. And the reason why there were money changers is most of the people that were coming into Jerusalem had money of another currency. They had to exchange it. And how many of you know that they just didn't give same for same? So they got the money in at this level and they gave the money out at that level. So they were making a profit. And, and in this moment, we see that they're merchandising the house of God. Can you believe that? Seriously, can you believe that people would have the audacity to go into the temple and try and make a profit from God's house? It happens today. It happens in all sorts of places today. You know, there are people that go to church not because they want God, they want new contacts. We had a situation here. We don't hand out members lists. And the reason why was somebody used it to try and recruit a downline for a multi-level corporation. And I'm sorry, we can't give it out to you, but somebody blew it for everybody. Do you know that people come to church looking for a husband or a wife? I had to talk to a guy one time. I just say, man, you're welcome to come, but get your eyes off the girls. And if you don't do that, then I want you to leave. There are all sorts of reasons people come to church. But there should be just one reason. We come for God. We come to know God. We come to worship God. We come to serve God. And we come to connect in God's family. Because none of us can do this alone. None of us. So he drove out. Now, do you know this isn't the first time? 
In John chapter 2, he drove out the money changers before, but they came back. And he did it with a whip. And he said to them, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Again, Jesus knows what the prophets' prophecies were. And he did what he did because it was prophesied that he would do this. Go ahead, Cheryl. But look what happened immediately after this. The power of God is revealed. It says, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. He healed them. You know, when we get back on track with God, the flow of God can increase even more. It's those things in our lives that are hindering God. Whether we're, we're looking for something that's not what God is wanting, that hinders God from having his way. And remember we, I think it was a couple of years ago before we went into our prayer and fasting, we, we had the scripture, search us and show us, God, if there's any way in us that's hindering you from having your way. That shouldn't be just something that every couple of years we look at. It should be something that we're really before God in our, our quiet time, our time of praise and worship of him. We're saying, God, I, I can't even know my own heart. But you do. Search me. Show me. Help me. Help me to see as you see. Help me to know as you know. Help me to love as you love. Help me to be like you. Then it goes on to say, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he did, even they saw they were wonderful. And the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Do you know this was the first Hosanna that was truly accurate because they knew who he was. They were indignant. And it goes on to say, and I don't have time to go through all the rest of these. And what happened during the week, like those lambs that were coming in to Jerusalem at the same time that the Lamb of God was coming, they were coming in to be inspected by the priests before they could be sacrificed to see and show that they had no blemish, they were not sick, they weren't uh, an inferior lamb that they were the best they had. They were inspected by the priest for four days. And the next days in the temple, Jesus would teach and he would be watched by the priests. And then he would be watched by the Romans and he would be watched by the people. And nobody could find fault or flaw with him because he was without flaw and without fault. And he was the lamb of God, the sacrificial lamb that they had been doing this for year upon year upon year upon year, and here was the real deal right with them, and they didn't know it. I pray God helps me. I pray God helps us to open our eyes that we would recognize the real, the true, the one and only God in our, life, our lives that can do what only he can do and not look to anything or anyone else to be our source or to be the one we serve because there's no one. No one can do for you what God can. And no one can do through you what God can has planned and can and will do when we let him. Amen? Amen? But I would encourage you, start at those points that I gave you in, in Luke and in Mark and John and even Matthew and begin to read through to the crucifixion and you'll see this amazing picture unfold of what was going on and how, how he taught and, and proclaimed things about his kingdom in these last few days that he was going to be here on earth before he paid the price and went to heaven. 
This is really important things to be aware of. And we have a few days to be able to study this out. I know you got a lot on your plate. I know everybody's busy. But I challenge you, lovingly challenge you, to read from these points onto the crucifixion and see what you learn. Like every head bowed, every eye closed. See, Jesus has paid it all. The Father gave his best. Jesus willingly gave up his life. And it was so that you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, all of us could be freed by our Redeemer. Not from a natural government or political party or anything else. Be free from the power of sin and death and begin to walk in this newness of life that has peace because we're set again at one with God. This joy, no matter what's going on, what we see, what we hear, what's happening, there's this joy, this confident expectation of good and hope. And that joy strengthens us. We can go, if we enjoy doing something, we can go and do it forever. There's a grace that God gives to impart to us and empower us to be what we were created to be and do what we were created to do, and only God knows that. If you're here today and you have never turned to Christ, there's no better time to do it than now. And it's not just about adding somebody to the team. He is now the leader of the team. Because if anyone else leads our lives, our lives won't be what God intended. He's come to bring abundant life and peace and joy and hope and a kingdom that can't be shaken a kingdom that's eternal that we become citizens of, that heaven becomes our home, and this earth is our place and opportunity to serve him and serve others. But if you've never turned to Christ and turned your life over to him, I invite you to pray with me today, whether you're here in person or online. It's an opportunity for a brand new beginning. And you know, we all need those at times. But I'm going to invite everybody to pray. So let's pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, who came and died on the cross, paid the price for my sin, conquered hell and death in the grave, and rose glorious and victorious on the third day. Today, King Jesus, I confess to you that I've sinned. I thank you for paying the price for my sin. I invite you now to lead my life. Come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Guide me. Govern me, guard me from this day forward. I am yours, you are mine. Thank you, Jesus, my Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer today and... and it was the first time. Let somebody know before you leave. If you prayed online, let us know because we want to be able to pray for you. Uh, go to the website, reslifeny.org. Scroll down to where the prayer requests are. Let us know that you prayed. If you want us to pray for you by name, give us your name. If you want to be contacted, give us some contact information. Would you stand? You know, there are two times during the year 
that people are not surprised that somebody is inviting them to church. Can you guess what they are? Right, right. And so I, I, I encourage you to pray. Pray and just ask God to show you, is there somebody you know that he wants you to invite to church? Because I will tell you next Sunday, what the children do is going to touch people's hearts. What the youth are going to do are going to touch people's hearts. What the praise and worship team is going to do are, is going to touch people's hearts. What the parking lot ministry is going to do is going to touch people's hearts. What the greeters and the ushers and what you greeting these people that you've never seen before but loving them on behalf of Jesus are going to do and what God's word is going to do is going to touch people's hearts and give them the opportunity to have a new eternity. This is huge. Don't miss that opportunity. I just want to pray for you. I'm praying for me. I'm praying for us all. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. Every day in our lives, we, we aren't aware of all of it, but Father, you're doing amazing, miraculous, man, magnificent things. And yet, Father, there are people that are going through life that don't know that you're there and that you care. Father, help us. Right now, I ask on my behalf and our behalf, if there's somebody that you know we should reach out to. Just put that name on in our heart. And Father, I thank you right now. I pray and thank you that if you give us a name, you give us the courage to be able to go. Help us to put ourselves aside to let these others have an opportunity to get ahead and come into your kingdom. Lord, we pray that all the churches that are proclaiming Jesus as Lord would be filled and that there would be miraculous and numerous salvations. Father, we thank you for family members being saved and friends being saved and neighbors being saved. Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you that you're gonna visit Rome and central New York again with a greater revival than when Finney was here. But Father, help us to recognize our part because we all have one. And help us to be willing and obedient as servants of the Most High God that we would be a part of miracles happening. And the greatest miracle that ever happens is that someone is saved. So we thank you, Father, for this. We thank you for this week in preparation as we prepare for celebrating the greatest victory ever won. Father, help us rejoice all this week and have an expectation that is beyond anything we've ever had. We thank you, Father, for all this. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. have a great week.